Time now for the Sunday Talk. Tonight, the politics of leadership. As you heard today, the NDP voted to replace Tom Mulcair as its leader. And with a Tory convention a year away, contenders for the Conservative leadership are already putting themselves forward. So both parties have the same challenge. Who do they have who can take on Trudeau? Being Prime Minister is not an entry-level job. Nice hair, though. Ah, hey, hey. In the last election, the Conservatives cast Justin Trudeau as a pretty face, but a hapless lightweight. I think if he uh, comes on stage with his pants on, he'll probably exceed expectations. Well, Trudeau came with pants and ran away with the race. You will be at the heart of this new government. His approval ratings are still high. Tom Mulcair may have been strong going into the election. Child care, health care, pharma care, mall care. But at ballot boxes, voters didn't care enough. Today, he was dealt a crushing rebuke by the NDP membership, and it's not clear who has the clout to replace him. So far, the field of Conservative contenders is thin. Maxime Bernier was tainted by scandal. Barbaric cultural practices. Kelly Leach is still relatively unknown. While everyone waits to see if big guns like Jason Kenney and Peter McKay declare, among the Conservative rank and file, there's a lot of buzz around former CBC Dragon Den personality Kevin O'Leary. The key to the Conservative Party is to forget about the past. It is completely irrelevant. I'm joined now by our panelists. Tasha Carradin is a columnist with the National Post and iPolitics. John Moore is a talk radio host in Toronto. And joining us from Edmonton tonight is Andrew Thompson, former NDP finance minister in Saskatchewan. So, Andrew, you were there when the vote was announced. It was, uh, it was quite the moment. And I'm just wondering, we're here to talk not so much about who's going to lead the NDP down the road, but what's happening in terms of leadership? What Was he shown the door because of him trying to move the party to the center or because of his personality? What was, what was his problem? Well, I think a lot of us believe Tom Mulcair deserved better today than he got in terms of a showing from the delegates. But uh, what really seemed to be at play was just a sense that the next election can't be the same as the last election. Uh, what that means is going to, uh, I think, is still very much up for debate. Does that mean uh, a move to the left? Does that mean a, a more... Uh, a uh, populist leader, is that somebody, uh, again, from Quebec, is that somebody who can appeal to Ontario? I don't know. But there did seem to be a lot of discussion over this last few days that it has to be something different. And I think that that's ultimately what happened to Tom. Uh, there's a lot of affection in that room for him. It was not by any means uh, a personal rebuke. What's your sense, John? You've been watching politics for a long time. This, I think this is the first time in modern history that an NDP leader has been sort of shown the door in that I think sense. it's the first time that any leader has been shown the door this dramatically. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have had not enough and they've said, okay, I hear you, I'm out of here. I think Thomas Mulcair suffered from bad timing. I mean, he's a charming man. I know there's the whole anger issue, but I always thought that was exaggerated by his opponents. I've known him, Tasha, you've known him since the, the days in Quebec. I never understood why you went with the NDP and sometimes he must wonder too because he'd be sitting in cabinet now had he run for the Liberals because he mm -hmm. would have won is riding. Um, he would come on my show during the election campaign, and I have a very conservative audience, and every time he came on, people would call in and say, I like this guy, I like what he's about. But I think the election was like one of these Milton Bradley games where it was just this teeter-totter, and as soon as it favored Trudeau, that was it. The NDP was finished. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of Canadians who were unhappy with the current government were looking for who would be their champion against it, who would unseat. And Thomas Mulcair definitely in the first part of the election campaign was on the upswing. And then when things started to go wrong, when the Liberals tacked to the left on the deficit, that was the first death knell. Then there came the kneecap controversy in Quebec when support declined there. We saw the rest of the country go that way too. So I think he was a combination of circumstance, but I think also personality in the sense that Trudeau incarnated a new generation of leadership. I think that was a big part of this election too. And Tom Mulcair is a different generation. And I think you saw that today in terms of the energy in the room. I wasn't in the room, but watching on television, people I think are looking for something fresher. One quick uh, point on the NDP, Andrew. We were hearing that the Conservatives on John's show loved uh, Tom Mulcair. <laughs> was that his problem with the NDP? I mean, did he go too far away from, from the, I guess, the people, the more left people in the party? Well, this has been a debate forever. I mean, we've always had this uh, kind of a waffle group within the party. I mean, there are those who definitely want it to go more left, but the leaders have always tended to track towards the centre, and it uh, really doesn't matter which leader you look at, federally or provincially. They tend to look for, uh, for middle ground, certainly on the left side, to push forward. Tom was very much in that tradition. 
I just think it's a case at this convention, people looked at it and said, we can't fight this uh, same election again four years from now, and we need to do something different. So what about the Conservatives, uh, Tasha? A convention a year mm -hmm. away, everyone's starting to just come out of the woods. Yes. Um, what, how do they tackle the, the Justin Trudeau challenge? It was still so popular. Well, the Conservatives have a bit of a different problem because, yes, Justin Trudeau has stolen a lot of the left's rhetoric. Um, it's not stolen the Conservatives on things like the deficit, but it seems, unfortunately, for the Conservatives, the Canadians don't seem to care very much. I think they will only start to care if it hits them in the pocketbook. And that's not going to be necessarily felt, assuming it will be felt in the next few years based on Trudeau's policy. So there's no connection yet between the budget, for example, and increased unemployment. Um, but if that happens, then the Conservatives have an opening. I think they really have to wait for that in a sense because they're going to stand for a very similar policy they have, policies that they have in the past. The question is whether I think the electorate is open to that vision. John? I used to have a high school French teacher who would begin uh, statements with, first advice I give to you, and the first advice I give to the Conservatives is do not make the mistake of continuing to assume that Justin is a disaster, that he's an mm -hmm. attention seeker, an empty-headed drama teacher, that this government is a Clydesdale wagon crashing off into the ditch. Uh, the latest poll has his, not uh, approval rating, but how many people would vote for the party at 51%. That is absolutely incredible. So I think what they have to do is understand there's a new form of leadership now. And it's about Twitter, it's about Facebook, it's about the fact that Justin Trudeau can fly himself into Toronto, take three meetings, and then spend 45 minutes on the social. And that's not piffling nonsense, that's the electorate. It's not piffling nonsense, but people, I think, are, are, and the press is starting to publish numbers on his travel, his costs of this and that. And I think over time, that might start to grade as well because there's one thing to be out in social media I totally agree that's different now that you have to be more present but there's the other side of being seen to do too much of that and it's something that I think they the government has to strike a balance on I think over time they may have to strike a better balance than they're doing right now I think so the other piece to go ahead sorry, Andrew? I was just gonna say the other piece to remember is that we really don't know what Justin Trudeau stands for at this mm -hmm. point he's just not Stephen Harper and people are still mm -hmm. really happy that he's not Stephen Harper <laughs> We'll see what this looks like six months from now as he actually starts to, you know, he's finished unraveling the conservative agenda and has to start forward, moving forward with a liberal one. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that, uh, you know, people are going to embrace that. We'll there was see. some pushback, Andrew, at, at the convention from people saying, I just never felt emotionally connected to, to Tom Mulcair, that he didn't let it all hang out and do the selfie parade. Um, is that something that, in this day and age, that every party has to accept to a certain extent that there has to be that that warmth that sort of love of meeting strangers <laughs> yeah I think there is some of that I mean the politics the way we conduct politics is changing but the other piece that is uh, quite different is that there's a almost a rebirth of kind of ideological divides and we see this in the you know with the Corbyn camp in the UK we see it with Sanders we see it with Trump uh, these guys who have really hard positions that are nowhere close to the mainstream getting tremendous traction and I think for those uh, leaders, and I would put uh, Justin Trudeau into that crowd, that are a bit more uh, moderate and middle ground, mm, it could be very uh, dangerous ground and slips away very quickly. I'm not sure if that's the basis of their appeal, though. I think a lot of it is a distrust of government and a distaste mm. for traditional politics. And I think both Sanders and Trump in the states embody that. Uh, Trudeau, to an extent, also was about doing politics differently. That was his whole mantra. Whether he actually does that concretely or not, he certainly gives the appearance of doing it. And I think that is something the other leaders have to bear in mind, too. You can't be seen to be in the same traditional mold of the traditional politician, which both, I would say, Mulcair and Harper were. But, Wendy, to your question about the Conservatives, I honestly don't think it's about leadership or leadership style, or it may not be anyway, uh, because I think their way back, and maybe you'll agree with this, is through policy. I think what they have to do is not say, we're the serious party and uh, he's the, you know, Justin Trudeau's Justin Trudeau. Right. They actually have to say, here's the budget we would propose. Here's the vision of Canada we would propose. And I think that is a way to return to power. But isn't that a challenge for a lot of the parties? I mean, Conservatives are going to have that. Obviously, we see this in Alberta, the fight between Wild Rose and the Conservative Party, that kind of old alliance faction, which a uh, reform faction, which hangs out in the Tories. We've got the leap question coming forward. There's a lot of divides within these parties. I think the question is whether you can actually still have big tent parties that really do bring people together and what kind of leader needs to be there to drive that. Yeah, and that is also going to be one of the factors is, of course, going to be what kind of voting system we have next time around. Mm. If we have a voting system that divides the parties or has proportional representation, for example, parties won't have to stick together necessarily. You might end up with leaders of smaller factions of parties because they may break apart. You won't need that consensus type of leadership that I think has mostly defined leaders in this country in the past. Can I say something really unpopular, though, and I'd love to hear what Andrew has to say <laughs> about <laughs> 
I get the buzzer here. I, <laughs> Go ahead. I, I just don't know what the point of the NDP is anymore, to be perfectly Ooh. honest. Um, the Liberals outflank them on the left. So you can either go extreme left, and God bless you. Which you'll they, be the, they might be doing with the Leap Manifesto. You'll be the rump party that you used to be, the conscience of Canada with a fine leader who will never be prime minister. Ooh, no, the, NDP, the NDP has always brought forward the new ideas on the left for progress, for working people in this country, and it will continue to do so. Periodically, when the Liberals lose their way, they come over, pick up our policy book, and implement it. Great. We have a lot more ideas. We'll do that again. But we we'll have seen the NDP that. not that long ago be torn apart. You mentioned the, the waffle movement. Are, are you afraid that this is the, the opening up in front of you now, the, the left versus the centre, no, I, I suppose? I'll tell you why. Yesterday was a fascinating day at convention. We had two m amazing speakers. We had Rachel Not Notley come in as the Premier of Alberta and give a tremendous defence of where the left is in creating jobs and building a better economy. And then in the afternoon, we had Stephen Lewis come in and explain why we need to move to a post-carbon economy. Delegates bought both of those, loved both of them. What we've got to figure yeah, out is within that, together? how we bring them what together. together. <laughs> but it's the same set that? of delegates. It wasn't half the delegates standing up saying they love Rachel and half standing up saying they love Stephen. They love both. What we've got to figure out is how do you reconcile that and what's that look like for a platform moving forward. Yeah, I, I don't know if that is reconcilable. And that goes to what I was saying is that you might end up well because if you're going to say that you're going to leave all the oil in the ground, it's going well, to be very difficult, very difficult that. to move forward. And I know it's true that the, that the LEAP manifesto, I know, does not exactly say to do that in the immediate term. But it certainly presents a very different vision for the long term that is pretty incompatible with a lot of what Alberta stands for. Just one last point on the Conservatives, John. And we've talked about divisions within the NDP. Divisions within the Conservatives, too. I mean, they're, they don't seem to know, Tasha, you mm -hmm. would know this, whether to turn left, right, center, <laughs> be friendly, not so friendly. I, I don't get a pulse on the Conservatives, except they've obviously come forward since the election and said we've got to be nicer. And they have to get over the sourpuss effect of Stephen Harper. And they also have to. I mean, currently on Facebook, I keep getting this panel that says, do you miss Harper? yet and the answer is no so you know the conservatives got to figure the way forward well the Last people quick point, Tasha. yeah like i was saying i think conservatives people will have to start not missing harper but necessarily missing what conservatives stand for and things like balanced budget lower taxes i think that the ontario example for example where liberals have been elected for four governments now um the conservatives missed their chance again last time is something the conservatives should look at very carefully they need the right leader and they need policies that aren't seen as mean to get their agenda across. Well, I wouldn't tell Patrick Brown to start measuring the drapes quite yet at Queen's Park. <laughs> 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 He's going like green, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Andrew. We got a wrap, but uh, great to have you on the show. My pleasure. Thanks to you guys. Take okay. care.